Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Washington Bike, Walk, and Roll Summit. I'm Barb Chamberlain. I'm the director of the Active Transportation Division with the Washington State Department of Transportation. My pronouns are she and her. We're excited to have you with us for our five-day virtual event. Here we are in day four, and we're thrilled to have folks from so many communities around the state and beyond. We'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. This summit is virtual, and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge the land Cascade Bicycle Club headquarters sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Squamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose lands you're on, look in the chat in a minute where you'll find a link to a map you can use to look up your place on the land. Without those communities, we would not have access to this environment. We take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. We'd also like to note that we are recording this session it will, and it will be available following the summit. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organization, organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington state, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride, and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists' rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable, and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. We wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have, have enabled us to bring together 15 panels with expert speakers and make registration free for all attendees. Thanks to our sponsors, Amazon and the Washington State Department of Transportation. I'll now quickly introduce the session and our panelists and topic. Panelists with us today are my colleague, Charlotte Claybrook with the Washington State Department of Transportation, Josh Diekman with the city of Tacoma, Scott Davis, also with WashDOT, and John Pascal with the Cooper Jones Active Transportation Safety Council. In this session, transportation ex experts from around the state discuss new guidance and recommendations for setting speed limits. There are policies, practices, and infrastructure improvements that can be used to lower driver speeds in order to keep people safe as they bike, walk, and roll. The panel will discuss tools for communities to implement those slower, safer speeds. The presentation format is that we'll have 10 minutes of introduction, about 70 minutes of panel presentation and audience Q&A, which is a longer presentation than some of the other sessions, a lot of information to present and share with you, and another 10 minutes for additional audience Q&A. You're encouraged to submit questions to the panelists through the chat bar and Zoom. And additionally, all registrants were informed of a set of community norms in your welcome email. If you feel these agreements aren't being met or you're feeling uncomfortable, please direct message the folks with an asterisk at the front of their name so we can assist. We're working to create brave spaces for conversations and we'll maintain a standard of respect as well as a space for growth. We also greatly value attendee feedback. A Google feedback form will be posted in the chat at the end of the session and also included in an email at the end of the day. With that, I'll now pass it to the panelists to introduce themselves and dive into the session. And Charlotte needs to unmute. All right, had a bit of technical difficulty there. My name is Charlotte Claybrook with the Washington State Department of Transportation. And um, I'm the Active Transportation Programs Manager there. I'm gonna be giving you the uh, first uh, part of this session, talking about um, uh, speed and safety, speed limit setting and uh, speed management. So um, first, I want to introduce um, the uh, Cooper jo Jones Active Transportation Safety Advisory Council. Um, you may hear some of us refer to it as the ATSAC, or the, which is the abbreviation for it. Um, it's a group that was um, created by the Washington State Legislature uh, with the purpose of eliminating fatal and serious injury traffic collisions involving people who walk and bike. Um, 
In uh, 2018, the group uh, came together, provided a set of recommendations, and one of those was to develop target speed uh, policies for use at all jurisdictional levels. So um, the Washington State Injury Minimization and Speed Management Policy and Guidelines Work Group was formed. Um, at the time, it was called a work group. Now the team uses, uh, or the council uses the term action team. So it was, it was one of the first action teams for the council. Um, the work group is made up of members, including representatives from cities, uh, counties, state agencies, federal agencies, and tribal government. And so um, at this point, I want to uh, let you know that as I provide this information and share, um, this is uh, from that work group's perspective. It's, it's, uh, it's not a policy that has um, been fully adopted by the Washington State Department of Transportation, but we are working on that. And the last presenter, Scott, will talk about some of the um, iterative, iterative steps that we've taken to get there. The other thing I want to say about my slides today is that I'm going to share with you some images of treatments that actually um, have worked. Um, that included that last slide with the speed hump. Each one has a different uh, image. And um, I'm not really going to be talking so much about um, speed management treatments, but um, did want to have that in there as the background to share. So um, the work group started by doing a, an in-depth literature review. Um, and I'm gonna share some of the key points that they, um, they, they identified from that. The first is that operating speed of a road increases the likelihood of uh, crashes. And the second there is that there is a link between speed and injury severity in crashes, it's consistent, direct, and especially critical for pedestrians. Um, another couple of points that are quite important um, that the group identified from the literature, speed management, design treatments such as roundabouts and road diets um, have been shown to be effective in lowering operating speeds. And another important thing uh, to keep in mind is even small reductions in speeds improve safety outcomes for a road. So um, the recommendations and guidance that the work group put together um, was intended to help uh, owners of public roads, streets, and highways to adopt uh, policies or uh, policy elements that the work group presented to um, implement injury minimization and speed management practices and policies um, and change their approach. So um, the, one of the core concepts between, for the policy shift is thinking about how uh, speeds are set in a different way. Um, where injury minimization is that priority that you're thinking about, where um, you uh, are trying to eliminate fail and serious injury crashes. So um, the concept here is to uh, start with a target speed. Um, this isn't an unknown uh, way to go about setting speed limits, um, but um, it is something that we haven't been using in practice so much as transportation professionals. So establish a target speed, and that target speed should be established based on the road characteristics, the potential for a crash, the kinetics, kinetic energy transferred in a crash, and the human body's ability to tolerate um, the, those forces. Um, the, um, once the target speed is set, then um, using default or category on target speeds is another useful piece of um, this approach. Um, for example, uh, a, a local agency may say, all residential streets in our city will be 20 miles per hour, non-arterial residential streets in our city will be 20 miles per hour unless posted otherwise. That's a default or a category speed. The second, the third bullet there is where the operating speed is within five miles per hour that that um, posted speed limit can be changed there and then continue to work to get to the target speed um, 
change to the target speed and continue to work. Where um, the target speed is uh, where the actual operating speed is more than five miles per hour above the target speed, um, then an iterative approach is needed. And that includes implementing speed management tools and setting iterative speed limits as you ratchet down. Um, make those incremental adjustments at five miles per hour or more um, as motorists respond to speed management until your target speed is reached. So that's the approach that the council uh, identified. And then other things to consider in, in the policy is that um, the safe system approach is used, and in particular to prioritize locations that present higher possibility of serious and fatal injury crashes. Um, if you're not as familiar with the safe system approach, I encourage you to listen to John Milton's presentation tomorrow afternoon, um, which uh, where he's going to provide some really good information about that. I've seen his slides before, and he's great. Um, end of commercial. Uh, so uh, another policy element that the work group put into their document is to consider injury minimization and speed management and all transportation improvements, all investments, regardless of funding source, planning, maintenance, construction, um, every time a dollar is spent, think about how you can eliminate fatal and serious injury crashes by lowering speeds down to that target speed for your agency. Um, Collaboration is key, especially with neighboring jurisdictions where a particular road um, ships into the, the other city or county, um, as well as training, uh, training uh, on injury minimization and speed management techniques. Um, access control uh, was another very important element that the work group um, decided needed to be part of uh, consideration in a policy. Um, that um, local agencies consider land use development and how that affects uh, speed and speed management. So um, another very important variable here, not a part of the policy necessarily, but um, uh, in recognition of the fact that if we don't have the public support, it's very difficult to make shifts. So um, just recognizing that education about uh, vehicle speeds effect on the likelihood of a crash and the severity of injuries should a crash occur. Um, that's very important and that part of the recommendations. There are, in fact, many recommendations in this document. And as soon as I finish with my slides, I'm going to um, put a link to the document in the chat so that um, you can upload that. Um, but just really quickly, there are recommendations about um, speed settings, some of which I've talked about already, about design and geometric recommendations, uh, traffic operations recommendations, issues for rural roads, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to read all these. I do want you to know that we did think about and talk about enforcement and education, uh, but the emphasis for this particular work was on uh, transportation uh, engineers, engineering practices, traffic control, and um, those things with that are within that purview. So um, less information about um, the other issues. So that's my presentation and I'm uh, happy to um, get additional information or questions you might have. Um, my contact information is there in the middle. Um, there's my uh, director, Barb Chamberlain at the top and my colleague, Brian Wood, in case you don't want to connect with them as well. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and hand this over to John. All right, thanks, Charlotte. I'm unmuted and ready to roll here. Uh, my name is John Pascal, and I'm a transportation engineer with a company called the Transpo Group in Kirkland, but I'm also a member of the Kirkland City Council. And as part of that role being an elected official, I get to serve on the Cooper Jones Active Transportation Safety Council and represent the Association of Washington Cities. So today I'll pre be presenting work of the council. In the presentation, um, I'm going to skip over some of the slides since Charla already talked about the, the Safety Council, but I do want to talk a little bit about the relationship between speeds and, and, and collisions. 
And the successes that we've seen uh, from some case studies on changing, comprehensively changing speed limits, and some barriers that agencies often face to that, and some of our recommendations that we plan to share with the legislature. I'm gonna skip this slide since you've already gotten an overview of that. Um, but one thing to note with the council is that we are housed within the Washington Traffic Safety Commission and their staff uh, supports us in, in what we do. Um, I do wanna mention all the members and acknowledge all the folks that do participate on the council. Uh, there's legislatively identified members that represent a, a, a number of organizations. And then there's other members that the Traffic Safety Commission has identified that are included. All of us are a great cross section of folks that are all working with that same goal in mind, which is to improve safety for walkers, rollers, and those on bicycles. So you've seen other similar illustrations about how vehicle speed is directly linked to crash shift severity. For those walking and biking, even a small increase in speed significantly increases the risk of serious injury or death. In addition to the increased impact potential, there are other factors to consider. At higher speeds, drivers are less able to react in time and avoid crashes. Their field of vision narrows, reducing their ability to see other vehicles or people walking or, or bicyclists trying to enter across the road. Unfortunately, traffic fatalities continue to occur across the state despite the state's longstanding target zero plan, which is to achieve tran trans a transportation system where there are zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries by 2030. As shown, these fatality trends are similar for all road users, whether they are driving, walking, or riding a bicycle. In fact, there has been little progress in lowering fatalities involving a pedestrian or cyclist. Serious injury crashes have continued to increase, while severe injuries involving pedestrians and bicyclists have slightly declined. Obviously a trend we'd like to see continue, but year after year, thousands of people die or become seriously injured while using state roadways. And vehicle speeds are the one variable that can change the equation. In 2019, 86% of Washington state fatal and serious injury crashes occurred on roadways with a posted speed higher than 25 miles an hour, as shown on the graphic to the left. One example from the city of Shoreline shows that roads with posted speeds of higher than 25 mile per hour comprise approximately 23% of their total roadway system. However, similar to the statewide trend, those roadways account for 79% of the serious and fatal collisions. So driver speed is a contributing factor in most fatal and serious injury crashes in the state. And it is time that we rethink how speed limits are set and how speed management techniques are used, especially in population centers where there's a mix of vulnerable users. Over the course of the last few decades, we've seen our communities change, both from the land uses and densities that come with growth in our cities, but also how we choose to get around. This includes people choosing alternative forms of transportation. So while our streets are changing, the land use beside them is changing and people are choosing different modes, our speed limits have not changed very much, except on a case-by-case -case situation or in a few cases on a more comprehensive basis. So it's time to think more holistically about how we can set our speed limits and what agencies can do to make more progress on our safety goals. This work isn't new. It builds on the work that Charlotte just shared with the injury minimization and speed management policies, but also builds on other recent work by NACDO um, on their city limits report and also the recent publication from the National Cooperative Highway Research Program released earlier this year. These, these efforts over the last couple of years are helping to reshape how we can address vehicle speeds. So let's talk a little bit about what communities are doing, how they're taking action, and kind of what the results show. In Boston, they modified their citywide speed limit from 30 to 25 miles an hour early in 2017 as part of their Vision Zero program. There was a study done by the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety that was conducted later that year, found that reducing the citywide speed limit to 25 miles an hour resulted in a drop in over, overall speeding while also dramatically decreasing the instances of high-end speeding, which are vehicles traveling faster than 35 miles an hour. The number of drivers exceeding 35 miles an hour dropped um, by nearly 30%. In 2015 and 2016, Toronto 
implemented a 30 kilometers per hour speed limit on its local roads. And the catalyst behind that was over the previous 12 years, almost 2,200 pedestrians were killed or seriously injured after being struck by a motor vehicle. So researchers at the hospital for sick children found that on streets where speed limits were lowered from 40 to 30 kilometers per hour, there was a 28% decrease in the number of collisions between pedestrians and motor vehicles and a 67% decline in the number of fatal and serious injuries. Many of you are aware of Seattle's action in 2020 to lower speeds on all its roads on its arterials to 25 miles an hour. To support this significant change, Seattle conducted case studies to understand the potential impacts. Data from, that, from those case studies showed that when Seattle signed streets for 25 miles an hour, total crashes declined, injury crashes declined, 50th percentile speeds declined, 85th percentile speeds declined, and high-end speeding declined for every location reviewed. The largest changes were in the reduction of high-end speeders and in a number of total crashes. Seattle also found lowering speed limits and increasing sign density alone absent any marketing campaigns, additional enforcement, or costly engineering changes to roadways resulted in lower speeds and fewer crashes. Shoreline completed a study in 2020 of speed limit policy along six arterial segments, presently signed at 35 miles an hour. The study used a new draft uh, speed limit setting tool to better account for pet, pedestrian and bicyclist use than historic speed limit setting practices. The study resulted in a recommendation to lower the speed limits to 30 miles an hour for five of the six roadways. Island County is currently conducting a study to comprehensively review the speed limits on all their roadways based on the latest best practices in speed management and speed limit setting. The study is designed to emphasize other factors beyond the 85th percentile with an objective to provide consistency across the county while also being sensitive to the rural context. These are just some of the local examples that I could find that are, are where communities are taking that comprehensive approach to reviewing their speed limits. So let's talk about the barriers. Why aren't more communities doing this? Local agencies frequently do not have the funding to maintain their current system, so it makes it difficult to take on more. Many agencies lack the capacity to under, undertake a comprehensive speed reduction program. However, changes can be, be made incrementally. Grant programs and technical assistance could help with resource constraints, particularly for small cities or counties. Education and outreach uh, to the community is really important as these changes occur. These efforts can be costly and time consuming for agencies. Some members of the public have the perception that reducing speeds will increase travel times or that changes on arterial streets will create more neighborhood cut through traffic. Articulating the benefits of speed reduction and sharing traffic analysis that shows modest impacts of speed reductions can reduce community concerns, but also build community support. And elected officials, like myself, will likely receive many complaints and simply not want to prioritize such a change because it's difficult. That is why these case studies and other research, along with adopted policies such as a Vision Zero plan, will help address those issues. The profession's understanding of appropriate speed limits has evolved, uh, but locally adopted design manuals not, might, not, uh, might not be updated to reflect current best practice. Also, where agencies delegate speed limit authority to elected officials, changing posted speed limits can be a time-consuming process requiring extensive data collection to justify each speed limit change. Delegating speed limit authority to agency staff can reduce the resources and times, time needed to make those changes. And I think many of you know, the Federal Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices requires consideration of the speed of free flowing traffic. This results in speed limits that do not consider all environmental factors. And then when it comes to enforcement, there's this belief that speeding is inevitable or that lowering speeds cannot be attained without enforcement. Uh, speed limit setting, design, and education can all impact speeds independent of enforcement and all ultimately reduce the need for enforcement. There's also this perception um, about enforcement that there's this desire to increase revenue. Consistently describing the safety and livability ben benefits of the changes can build that public trust. And then there's many police departments that are actively changing how they conduct enforcement in a way that is less likely to make community members feel unsafe. Automated enforcement, uh, which is allowed in school zones today, can help reduce the demand on limited law enforcement. Educating the transportation community is really important. 
Uh, while Washington State has adopted more robust speed limit setting guidance, uh, this, um, let me see where I'm at. Transportation professionals at agencies may still be unaware of all these changes. Industry guidance that would help professionals assess speed limits using other measures is relatively new and is not well known to everyone. And speed data is relatively inexpensive to collect and is straightforward and as a, as a quantitative measure. So we tend to over rely upon it for making decisions. While there is, when it comes to lack of data and supporting research, there's a lot of data, there's, there's more data supporting the importance of reducing speed to reduce serious injury and fatality crashes. And there's ample research on the effects of infrastructure improvements to lower speeds, but there really is little published research regarding the impact of just speed limit changes alone on safety outcomes. And many professionals are familiar with older studies that do not show a clear benefit to posted speed reduction. However, more recent studies with higher quality data are now becoming more available. So the key findings, just to wrap up here, I think I boiled it down to three. One was this, despite target zero and other efforts to reduce fatalities and serious injury crashes across the state, the numbers are not decreasing fast enough to reach those adopted goals by 2030. Recent studies have shown that speed limit signage alone can make a difference in lowering speed limits if done as part of a system approach to addressing vehicle speeds. And we're pleased to learn that that several cities and counties in Washington State are already thinking how they approach speed limits. While the report has a long list of recommendations, I boiled them down to three, uh, six recommendations here. The first is to encourage agencies to adopt regulations and policies that give greater consideration to land use context and other factors beyond the 85th percentile in setting of speeds, speed limits. The second is to develop guidance and standards to support comprehensive city or countywide speed limit changes rather than a, on a case by case basis. The systems approach is absolutely critical to realizing benefit. Data can be a limiting factor for many agencies. Developing a statewide access to collision, traffic volume, and speed data tools that local agencies could utilize would, be, would, would really help. And then funding can always be a catalyst to affect change. Creating funding options for area-wide speed limit changes or speed limit changes within school walking zones or business districts or residential areas is something that needs to be explored and be part of that toolbox. Then finally, providing more training and educational opportunities to share success, success stories and approaches to modifying speeds on a comprehensive basis. And we also believe that the RCW 4661-415 should be expanded so that roads outside of residential and business districts can be posted 20, 20 miles per hour without a required traffic study, and that county roads and state routes be eligible under that statute. And that statute basically allows agencies to uh, reduce speeds, speed limits down to 20 miles per hour in those areas uh, without a traffic study. So here's my contact information. If you have any questions, I gave both my, my Kirkland, City of Kirkland uh, contact info and my Transpo group details. You're free to reach me at either. Um, we will have a draft report on the Active Transportation Safety Council in the next month or two. And I do wanna mention that this was a team effort. Action team members are listed here, include Charlotte, Josh, Yongho, we had some great advisors that assisted us, uh, Kendra from the city of Shoreline, Nikki from Island County, and Mike, Mike Swires from Washdot Northwest Region. Thank you, and I'm gonna be turning it over to Josh. Thank you, John. And um, I would like to start by thanking Charlotte, who's gonna be sharing my slides. And I apologize, I was experiencing a little bit of lag earlier, so. Um, if there are any audio, audio difficulties, I apologize in advance. And again, thank you, Charlotte, for pulling up my slides. As Charlotte's doing that, I um, wanted to introduce myself. My name is Josh Diekman. I manage tra traffic engineering and transportation planning for the city of Tacoma, and I also act as the city uh, traffic engineer. Um, I'm also a member of the Cooper Jones Active Transportation Safety Advisory Council, which, as John and Charlotte mentioned, is supported by the Washington Traffic Safety Commission and is tasked with annually preparing recommendations to the governor and state legislature regarding issues related to active transportation safety. So I'm in here for in two roles, uh, one to speak in part to Tacoma's experience with automated enforcement, 
and in my other role to speak about the recommendations from one of those action teams from the Cooper Jones Committee about how automated enforcement is used in Washington. Next slide, please. My presentation is about 16 slides long, and it's roughly presented in four segments as shown on the screen. The first is an overview of how automated enforcement is currently used in Washington, followed by some information about how it's used in Tacoma, which will transition into a discussion of some considerations about the importance and relevance of automated enforcement. And then I'll wrap up with uh, the recommendations from a 2020 report prepared by the action team from the APSAC. Next slide, please. Uh, so in Washington state, as you may be aware, Washington currently allows automated enforcement at select locations only, and John mentioned school zones. And the other locations it's allowed are uh, red light cameras at arterials and rail crossing signals. Uh, additionally, Tacoma has authority for a standalone speed camera that's outside of a school zone. That was originally part of a pilot location, but has since been made permanent. And Seattle is currently authorized to conduct a new pilot study for several other areas of focus, including transit or restricted lane use, and is what's known as don't block the box enforcement. Next slide, please. The number of agencies using automated enforcement is still relatively low. Survey data um, from the Washington Traffic Safety Commission in a report that they prepared in 2018 identified 236 law enforcement agencies at Washington at the state, county, city, tribal, and university level. I should point out that each local agency needs to adopt an ordinance to begin automated enforcement, and the law, the, the, the authority in the law doesn't lie with the law enforcement agencies to adopt the program. Uh, WashDOT was, I mean, I'm sorry, the Traffic Safety Commission was, um, I think, using a survey method that was used in Maryland, and um, I suspect that um, also most, if not all, of the agencies in Washington that use automated enforcement have law enforcement involved at some level. So at the time of the survey, uh, 17 of the agencies were using one of the forms of automated enforcement. A 2020 survey showed that the number of agencies had increased to 18, and all of the places where it's deployed are local agencies. And the next slide shows a little bit about where those are located around the state. On the map on the next slide, you can see that a handful of the agencies use either red light or speed cameras, but most of them use both. The smallest city using automated enforcement is about 10,000 population, which is Fife, and the median size of agencies using automated enforcement has a population of around 40,000. Tacoma geographically is right in the middle of many of the agencies shown on the screen. And the next slide shows the locations where automated enforcement is used in the city of Tacoma. So similar to other agencies around the state, Tacoma has a mix of red light and school speed zone installations. Uh, we operate nine red light running cameras, four school zone speed installations, and as I mentioned, the one fixed speed location. Uh, that's the unique part in Tacoma is that one fix, fixed speed, the camera, uh, which is on the right-hand side of the map here and labeled as Bay Street. And so I'm gonna spend the next couple of slides uh, talking about that one because it is a little bit unique and might point to how we could use automated enforcement at um, locations in the future to address locations where speed is an issue. Next slide, please. So Bay Street is part of State Route 167, and this camera, camera was uh, originally installed in November of 2009, and it began with a two-week warning period, and then infraction and, and enforcement became and began in December of 2009. Uh, before the camera got installed. There had been a couple of crashes at the curve that resulted in fatalities. Uh, I think one of them was a run off the road rollover onto the train tracks, and one was a head on lane departure. Um, just for some context of the area, um, you'll see on the upper side of the slide there, there's some rail right of way there. Um, on the inside of the curve, uh, there's tribal cemetery. Uh, it's also bounded by some wetlands, and so that curve you see there. Um, had very limited opportunities to do other countermeasures or to reconstruct the roadway. Um, lane reductions were also uh, something that was going to be hard to do and problematic. The ADT in 2015 was about 45,000 vehicles a day. Um, although some of this might change when WashDOT completes SR 167 as part of the Gateway Project, and so that might open additional opportunities on the road in the future, but we don't know that yet. Um, I think that one of the things that really led to consideration of automated enforcement here, aside from a limited option to install any countermeasures and some of the safety experience that we had seen, was the support from Tacoma Police Department. And as you'll see on the next slide, um, 
there's really limited options or opportunities for uh, any traditional enforcement in this location. Not only is there uh, no location for law enforcement personnel to observe the curve, um, there's also uh, very limited opportunities to pull someone over safely. And so the camera that's out there right now operates in the northbound direction, which is the viewpoint that's shown on the screen. The speed limit for the roadway is 35 miles an hour, and there's a curb warning sign that you see on the screen with an advisory speed of 25 miles an hour. Historically, I believe the camera only actuated at around 40 miles an hour and citations were issued at 45, but I don't know if this is current practice with our current vendor. Uh, I would note that this discretion is also used when reviewing citations and they're rigorously reviewed. And I think that there is some benefit to that in having not just the vendor review them, but then the officer. Um, and I, I think that that helps when there are any questions that get back to some of the things that John mentioned about people fearing that it's a money grab or motivated by something other than traffic safety. In any case, the tool is being used very judiciously, and that's part of the reason that the city of Tacoma wants to ensure that the tool remains viable, um, because there are limited other means in this location and in others to address speed. And um, because we are actually seeing that this camera is changing, positively changing the safety outcomes at this location. Next slide, please. So uh, as mentioned at the end of 2009, the camera was installed. Uh, the statistics on the screen were prepared by the Tacoma Police Department, and they showed that the frequency of collisions decreased during the initial time of use in the camera. In a more recent report prepared by the police, they show that only 10 total collisions have occurred in the past three years from 2018 through 2020. And in 2021, the Public Works Department took over management of the automated enforcement contract. And so as part of that, Public Works will be expanding the analysis of the efficacy of the program and of all the installation locations. So I hope that in the future we'll have more robust data to share. And in the meantime, I think that Tacoma's example illustrates that there's some practical realities that make automated enforcement a help, helpful supplement to in-person enforcement. There are some other reasons for this too, and I'll discuss those later when I talk about the recommendations from the Cooper Jones Act for Transportation Safety Advisory Committee to set the stage for the recommendations. Uh, over the course of the next few slides, I want to highlight some of the reasons that speed enforcement is so important. Um, next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, ATSAC adopted the recommendations in their 2020 annual report, and those recommendations were developed by a subset of the ATSAC uh, an action team, which we heard about from Charlotte and John before, and the information on the next couple of slides some of it was explicitly considered by that action team, and some of it I've included as representative of the things that action team has considered. And so they're labeled as background, but some of these things were explicitly considered by that action team. And so on this slide, I wanted to delve into one of the reasons that addressing speed and speeding is important. It's because the records show that speed is a factor in about a quarter of the fatal collisions in the U.S., and in Washington, that percentage rises to nearly a third of fatal collisions. And of course, it also has significant influence on crash outcomes for vulnerable users. Um, most people have seen some version of the bottom figure, and John shared a similar one earlier, and that highlights the drastic change in outcomes that can be seen with small changes in speed. Speed is one of the factors that is, that's contributing to recent increases in the number of fatal and serious injury collisions in Washington. And the figure on the next slide is from the 2019 State Highway Safety Plan, Target Zero. And it shows that trends for pedestrian and bicycle collisions have generally not been headed in the right direction. As we can see from this graph at the time of the last report, we were headed the wrong way. And the importance of speed enforcement target to active transportation safety is only intensified since the graphic on the screen was produced. During the pandemic, WashDOT reported that while the overall number of crashes for all modes declined, the number of speed-related crashes and the number of crashes involving active transportation users increased. We know that automated enforcement is an effective tool for addressing speed and achieving lasting behavioral change, but we also know that it's not universally supported. Uh, but what is pretty universally supported is um, school speed safety, and that is what the next slide touches on. So traffic safety around schools has long been universally supported in state laws with things like school zones and automated enforcement in school zones. However, even though safety for students walking and rolling to school has been an emphasis for decades over the years, we've also seen a notable decline in the number of people walking and rolling to school, and as shown on the figures on the screen, uh, which are taken from the city of Tacoma's um, Safe Routes to School Action Plan. 
the percentage of children walking to school decreased 73% between 1969 and 2009. We know that we can increase the number of students walking and biking to school through effective safe routes to school programs. However, in the meantime, we know that many students walk and roll to school out of necessity, and even when conditions have not yet been improved, and there's an equity issue that's central to this discussion. Next slide, please. On the topic of equity, according to the 2020 Washington State um, Student Travel Report, students at schools with lower relative income saw 14.3% of children walking to school in 2019 compared with 8.8% of children with schools uh, that had re relatively higher income. And uh, the image on the slide shows the uh, results. Oh, previous slide, please. The research also shows that as the income gap widens, so does the walking rate. And so the image that is on the previous slide shows that one and a survey that included one in 10 communities in California, schools with less than 20% of students enrolled in free lunch programs saw a walking rate of 13.3%, but schools with more than 80% saw a walk rates of 54.9%. Now, I, I wanted to note that the researchers in that study noted that walking rates in low income communities were in their words, um, despite greater environmental and safety concerns. And that highlights the need to focus safe routes to school resources on those schools. Automated enforcement programs can be one way to support this effort by directing any funding proceeds to the places that it's needed most. And so with those factors in mind, ATSAC, the, the action team, and then later ATSAC chose to focus its recommendations on automated traffic safety in school zones. Although there's opportunity um, much greater than that. Next slide, please. The primary recommendation would expand the existing authority for automated traffic enforcement systems beyond school zones to the school walk areas. Now, part of ATSAC's recommendation was also that jurisdictions consider the hours of the day the cameras are operated and that recognizing that schools typically perform many of the functions in a community outside of school hours, like childcare and community gathering places or as places for recommendation. Um, they, they thought that jurisdictions should give some thought to how those uh, times of day are used. Next slide, please. Now, the next recommendation from the ATSAC was that the uses or any potential net revenues from automated traffic enforcement systems would be uh, designated to specific areas. Now, I should note to begin with that operating the systems is, is expensive, uh, but in some cases they are revenue positive. And in those cases, there is opportunity, like I said previously, to direct those resources to where they're going to do the most good. And um, the discretion about how to use those funds and the direction of how they're used can vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In Tacoma, the authorizing ordinance requires that any revenues go to a dedicated fund that can only be used for traffic safety purposes. And about 10% of that currently goes to Public Works, which manages the contract, and then other costs are related to court and the police department. Uh, Kirkland's ordinance requires that all net revenues be directed to street, pedestrian, bicycle, and traffic improvements near schools, for instance. And Seattle also has historically dedicated a sizable portion of the fund to their school traffic safety and pedestrian improvements fund. Now, ATSAC considered some of those examples, and they recommended that one of the modifications in the RCW would be to include a stipulation that net revenues can only be used to support safe routes to school efforts such as enforcement, infrastructure, education, school crossing patrols, and ADA accessibility improvements. I should note that since ATSAC wrote the report, um, the RCW authorizing the pilot program in Seattle declared that any net proceeds from the pilot program should be split 50-50 with half being retained by Seattle, but to be only used for transportation improvements that support equitable access and mobility for persons with disabilities. And the other half is directed to be deposited in the state's Cooper Jones Active Transportation Safety Account, which supplements the resources for the Traffic Safety Commission and um, also the grant programs that they offer local agencies. So ATSAC members have discuss the benefits of a structure like this and feel that if additional legislation does move forward, having that sort of revenue sharing arrangement with the Traffic Safety Commission in place uh, could be a good way to do that. And it could help to enable investments throughout the state, even when agencies have not adopted automated enforcement. That would help um, address one of the concerns that, uh, and make maybe the authorizing legislation more pal palatable by demonstrating that agencies are using automated enforcement as a safety tool rather than a revenue generation tool. 
The final point that I wanted to focus on is related to equity, and that's the next slide. And I wanted to close this, this, this one, not because the report had a specific recommendation on that. Um, the report did feel that it was important to call this out, uh, but it didn't really have the recommendations about how it, to resolve the issues that had been identified. It did, though, note that we need to be thoughtful about how we use automated enforcement and how it can be used equitably. equitably. In particular, at this time, uh, John mentioned um, that you know the many police departments are reevaluating how they interact with the community and striving to do that in a way that makes the community feel safe. And there's also a lot of good reasons to be considering automated enforcement as part of that discussion, because automated enforcement reduces the need for in-person contacts and inherently removes some of the question of bias. However, we have to simultaneously recognize that many of the communities where traffic safety issues are the most prevalent and in the most need of attention, and thus the areas where automated enforcement's likely to be applied are frequently the same areas that have been historically underserved, and deploying automated enforcement in those communities may also disproportionately impact populations that are least able to afford it. So as each agency moves forward, and we will be evaluating this in Tacoma as we consider adding or moving our current locations, um, enforcement equity and economic equity should be part of the conversation. Thank you. that abrupt transition, I will hand it back over. So uh, I think Scott's going to go next. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, see, I need to get my screen situated here. So hopefully I can read some of my notes. Um, all right. So Hi, I'm uh, Scott Davis. Uh, I'm with uh, the uh, Washington Department of Transportation. I, I work in the transportation office in our in, in headquarters in Olympia, Washington. I, I've been here for about two years. Prior to that, um, I was a county traffic engineer at uh, Thurston County uh, Public Works. Um, also served on the, I guess it's the action team uh, that helped put together the injury, injury minimization uh, speed management guidelines that, that Charlotte went through uh, earlier. Uh, so anyway, I'm glad to be here. I uh, really enjoyed listening to Charlotte, Josh, and John's presentation. So I guess I guess I'm kind of hitting the end of this. I guess I should have the most exciting presentation, but I don't know about talking about policy and, uh, and and standards is the most fun thing in the world. But anyway, we'll get through it. It's not super super long. Um, so uh, you know, looking back at you know look, looking at this session and the implementation policy um, at the state the, at the state level, it at least provides that one of the first glimpses of policy changes that can reflect can reflect our injury minimization goals, but also can serve as a template for other local agencies. So I'm gonna talk really briefly about um, that first step for us. And I, I kind of wanna emphasize what, what I'll share today. Um, it's really a first step, because anytime I go for a walk, we, we take more than one step. And, and this, this, this effort to get to zero, um, uh, zero fatalities and serious injuries uh, in, in the state of Washington uh, it, it isn't a one step process, it, it takes time. And so, and changing our policies uh, uh, and adapting them and evolving them takes time as well. All right, so uh, before getting into the changes, I just wanna give you an overview of the traffic manual and kind of kind of where some of these documents lie within the department. So this manual is written primarily for our uh, six region traffic offices and outlines policies, procedures, processes, and, uh, and to help manage some of the different tasks the region traffic offices have. I mean, and what they do is really similar to a, a city transportation office or a, a county transportation office. Um, uh, and although it's written for an internal audience uh, within the department, um, often city and county officials do use it to help guide their own efforts, just as I did when I was, when I was at uh, Thurston County uh, not too long ago. Um, and one of the, absent the document is was, getting old, I guess, or getting a little bit dusty. Uh, really one of the main uh, uh, reasons we wanted to dive into it is really to give a broader transportation perspective and multimodal approach to the manual. Uh, and, and, you know, we have evolved, we've evolved as a community, we've evolved as a state, and so has the Department of Transportation. So, you know, the guidance and information we share with our, our transportation offices needed to evolve with that. Um, the approach or the, the update uh, included four new chapters uh, and uh, we, we, we expect to be a little bit more, uh, or we'll be updated more regularly, I guess, uh, especially especially as, as um, 
our uh, we evolve our, our uh, views on them and policies on, on injury injury minimization for for speed limits. Uh, so just a just a quick overview. There's 12 chapters in the manual. Uh, we're going to cover a, a little bit of chapter six. So there's a lot more in there. Um, the highlighted chapters are, are the ones that are actually new new uh, for this year. Um, but anyway, we're we're just going to cover chapter six, which talks about some of the traffic regulations and processes that that we take as a department to to analyze different regulatory uh, aspects of, of the highway system. Okay, so I'm going to repeat. I think I'm, I'm probably repeating all three speakers today. But uh, you know, we know we know it's unlikely uh, that that you know people can survive high speed crashes, and we know reducing speeds uh, can reduce the injury severity in in different ways by reducing impact forces, providing an additional time for drivers to stop, as well as improving visibility. Um, and setting incredible speed limits is just one part of that safe systems approach, which includes vehicle technology, safer roads, post-crash care, as well as safe road users. And, and it sounds like there's gonna be a presentation on that tomorrow. It'll go in that in safe systems on a lot more detail. Um, so, you know, the safe systems, injury minimization, our, our target zero approach to safety in the state of Washington to help guide the updates to our speed limit process. So it better reflected the values that we have as a department, but also as a community, as a, the broader community. One of the significant changes, um, and probably it shouldn't be too surprising, uh, is, is a shifting away from the 85th percentile speed. Um, and, and this is one of the uh, recommendations in, in the injury minimization speed limit uh, recommendations and, and, and guidelines. Um, we're still going to collect the data, but we're going to focus more on the pace speed um, and other factors such as context, crash history, land use uh, that, that were mentioned earlier or, or earlier in this session. Again, um, this is consistent with the recommendations that, that were provided for setting speed limit policies. Um, and if you're not familiar with the, the pace speed, uh, the pace speed is essentially a range of speed that the vast majority of the cars are traveling at on a particular stretch or segment of roadway. While the 85th percentile speed is the maximum speed of free-flowing vehicles that 85% of the drivers are driving at or below. So that's actually a pretty significant change when we're looking at, when we're just looking at the, the speed data. Um, and so that, that, that's a big change for the department, how we look at it. And I think we, we and John mentioned earlier is, is, you know, that that's part of that culture shift that we're undergoing as an agency as we, we want to and we need to look at um, not only just setting speed limits, but as we, we look in and we evaluate different projects and do studies, we really do uh, need to look at them differently. And this is part of that process. Um, the, one of the other big changes is recognizing the 20 mile hour speed limits uh, that can be set statutorily within cities and towns. And so uh, we didn't recognize that until now. Um, and so this, and, and the guidance also uh, encourages and a more thorough review in population centers. So this not only include this includes um, unincorporated communities as well as urban town or incorporated towns and cities, and more uh, obviously more dense urban areas. But that, that was a big again another big change because I'll, I'll, more more and more cities are looking at that option uh, to help with their speed management uh, uh, process. And so um, that was part of what we were looking at doing too as a department is recognizing that and working with our our city partners and town partners. Uh, to help help with uh, what they're trying to achieve within their city limits. Uh, the guidance also recognizes in some cases uh, setting iterative speed limits over time until the physical changes um, can be in place to help influence or reach a uh, desired target speed. We talked, talk, Charlotte talked about target speeds a little bit earlier. And so, you know, sometimes we don't have the resources to make the necessary investments to, to really Put the have the environment that supports what we'd like it to be, and so it may be a, a period of time before we get there. And so that's what the iterative process is kind of getting at. And so some strategies Charlotte mentioned are road diets. Um, one thing with road diets, uh, not to get too much too into the too too detailed into it, is um, is they can be really inexpensive. You're just talking about striping on some roadways, uh, and I also recognize there's trade offs that will be discussed as we as as an agency goes through a road diet process because oftentimes. We're talking about safety, but also we're talking about accepting a higher level of congestion, which is certainly okay. Um, but just recognize those trade-out discussions will happen when, uh, when when road diets come up. Uh, roundabouts, of course, speed feedback signs, traffic calming, simple things like bulb outs, which could be painted in some cases as a starting place. So again, an iterative infrastructure pro process as well. And one of probably the lowest cost things to do, um, but and, and also easiest is just 
uh, for agencies, including Washington State, to review visibility of signs and placement of signs, because the signs are no good if you can't see it. And so, um, and sometimes just making sure they're visible and at appropriate intervals can make a difference as well. Um, so uh, these changes in 2021, like I mentioned, is really a first step, not the final step. These policies are gonna be changing um, as, as our department continues that discussion, how best to incorporate the injury minimization recommendations into our own activities. And so this is gonna be an evolving process and, and it should be an evolving process as we move forward and, uh, and, and move forward in, in how we look at speed limits on our state highway system. All right, so this is the, the last slide, I guess. I, you know, this could have been a first slide, I suppose, too, but um, this, is, this is an excerpt of the Washington Administrative Code, um, you know, 468-95045. And that's actually what guides uh, public agencies when they're evaluating doing speed limit studies. Um, and so, but it serves as a good wrap up because there's a couple points in here. One is, is you know right now it does emphasize two degree 85th percentile speeds. It's the first bullet underneath the, the title. Um, but if you notice, I uh, highlighted the word should. So the word should is, is flexible, meaning that right now, um, although it, it has all these criteria, there's quite a bit of criteria there, it gives us as a public agency or state agency flexibility to adapt our criteria like we did um, and like I just, just discussed briefly. And so other agencies can do the same things while still meeting the current, you know, current state law and, and Washington Administrative Code requirements. However, this also represents a next step too. Um, and the next step is, is really taking a look at this, um, this piece of the code um, in the future uh, as a future, future work group task to help adapt it to better reflect our injury minimization focus and priorities within Washington State and, and hopefully create a more flexible um, a process for, for public agencies um, when they're evaluating speed limits and where and when they want to improve the safety um, on, on their roadways. Um, so let's see, I think that's it. All right, so I, contact information. So, uh, so I'm down here, I'm speaking today, but our primary contact with our transportation office is Deanna Brewer. Um, but you certainly can contact both of us, but uh, she's, she's the primary contact for, for our headquarters related speed limit questions. Um, depending on what region you're at, um, there's also the region traffic offices as well. So thank you very much. And I guess, uh, I guess we're turning this over to questions right now. I will stop sharing. We'll figure that out. All right, this is Barb. We've had a, a lively discussion in the chat. So I was looking quickly, looking quickly, trying to pick out some of the highlights. Um, and, and I think we've addressed some of the questions. I wonder if you might sort of collectively speak to, and I'm weaving a couple together. People asked about the fact that we have bigger vehicles with blunt front ends, and that's something the state doesn't regulate. So could you just maybe put a little more shape around why we need to focus on engineering in a safe systems approach because we can't change the vehicles. Um, and, and I know we have a safe system session tomorrow, but not everybody might be able to, to jump into that one. So anybody who wants to give a thought on that, and then I'll, I'll look at some of our other questions. Here. Well, I might start, Barb. I think everyone else will probably chime in, but you know, I think that's where the design piece comes in, especially. Uh, you know, everyone, we were talking about speed in the session, right? And so, you know, part of the infrastructure piece when we're looking at projects or even retrofitting existing intersections is we should be taking a look at speeds and we can do a lot to reduce speeds, whether it's putting a roundabout in or, or changing the radius on a curve or on, a, I mean, it's not a curve, but you know, a, a quarter radius and an intersection that can make a big difference. Um, and so, uh, you know, whether it's a truck or a car, uh, you know, there's small changes we can make that, that, that can reduce that speed incrementally or, or even significantly depending on the location. And, and of course, Charlotte touched on a lot of those different things in her presentation. Anybody else want to add anything on this? I'll chime in. Mm -hmm. So um, I, 
I have seen a lot lately about the size of vehicles, and I don't doubt that that's a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I do uh, want to remind uh, um, you that the the work that uh, the transportation professionals at the Department of Transportation and um, the cities and counties are doing really, um, we have the um, its sphere of influence. And that sphere is to change the road design, uh, the traffic to con control devices, and um, the policies that we use to set speeds and to, um, to get uh, speed management. Um, I uh, sincerely hope that our other partners out there are going to take up that uh, road, the vehicle size issue as we move forward because it is definitely an issue. And um, thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. I'll jump to one. There's several questions that have different ways of saying why do we start from what drivers want to do? Um, start, we're starting from a design context that's already cueing them to go fast. Why don't we turn it around? And I'm paraphrasing what several folks have said. Why don't we start with low speeds and make you justify why you should be able to drive faster, for example? Why don't we start with a 15 mile per hour instead of a 20 mile per hour as a school zone speed? So I, I know we have a lot of history and you can't overcome it all, but we do have the better part of a half hour left. I wonder if anybody wants to sort of wrestle with the 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 challenge of changing a system. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Yeah, I'll I'll just kind of share my thoughts. I mean, it's a, it's a really good introspective question um, or questions, really thinking about speed and uh, you know, to me, it's really about a paradigm shift, right, and how we even approach things. Um, so it's a it's a good question to ask. Um, I think kind of practic pra from a practical perspective, I think the reason why, for example, in my discussion around kind of comprehensive speed limit changes, uh, really approaching it from the fact that um, we have these speed limits that are out there today and we're looking at, at ways, in many cases, to, to lower them uh, to fit the context of what's changing around us. So um, maybe if we were starting from a clean state, clean slate, it would be different, but I think that's kind of the reason why I think we're thinking about that is, is we have these speed limits and we're thinking about how do we, how do we change them? And usually it's changing them by in, in lowering them, um, not necessarily raising them. Anybody else want to take a crack at that? I, and I might uh, tag Scott, I mean, where this, the highway system is our responsibility, but some of those highways are local roads. So one of the questions that came in for the panels is why are we as an agency using motorist speed to decide how safe it is for the folks who are walking and biking, knowing that's not the only factor? Yeah, th thank you, Barb. Uh, I was actually just writing a right response in the, the comment tab, but I guess it's better verbally. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, it, may, it might have just been, uh, you know, I, I emphasize that in the presentation a bit um, in terms of speed, in part because moving away from the 85th percentile speed, I, I think was a big decision for our office and for our department. You know, whether that, you know, whether we're slow, slow to doing that or not, it, it was a big change. And so I talked a little bit about that more. So maybe I emphasize it more than I probably should have. Um, so I, I should have, right? But, um, but anyway, but no, the Washington Department of Transportation takes account a lot of factors. And, and so we take account context, land use, the users of the roadway, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, what's going on around it? Are there schools? Are there parks? Um, you know, all those other activities that go on that, that uh, either generate or, or, or could cause uh, or, or result in a lot of users around a roadway system. And so those are important pieces of the decision-making process. And those, so do we, do we collect data? Yes, we do collect data for traffic volumes and those things, because it helps build that contextual piece. Um, but um, I guess maybe the question is, the speed component is a much less, um, uh, it's, it, it's not, it's, I'm not going to get the right word out, so I apologize, but it, it, it's a, it's a lot, it's, it's part of the process, it's not the whole process, and, um, and, and you know, again, it's part of that culture change. I think that the question earlier is, as a lot of our offices are, and as well as local agencies, um, are, it's going to be a cultural shift and a training shift in how we really should be looking at our transportation system in a much more broad broad perspective, because the, the person who made the comment was right. It's not just vehicles. There, there's a lot of users on the roadway, and that is part of that shift in our policies is to, in a recognition, uh, recognition of that, and it's going to evolve. So, 
And I might take moderator privilege to also note, we have our new analysis of the state routes out in the active transportation plan. And it's a starting point, it's a macro analysis, but we take speed into account as one of the elements that creates a roadway that is not inviting or desirable for active transportation use. And if we want to invite and delight, to borrow a phrase somebody used in one of the presentations last year, I think, then, then it needs to have the kind of speed and infrastructure combination that means that you can move through there. And we aren't there yet, and we don't have the money to get there, I'll just say, but even examining state routes and asking are, what are they like for active transportation is new. That is not a standard thing that state DOTs routinely do. So I do want to do a little of this and to Charlotte and to my colleagues who helped with it, that um, we have information we didn't have before to say things about the potential active transportation use, not just are we counting you today, but where should we be able to count you in the future if we have those counters? Um, so I'll get a link into the chat because I never miss an opportunity to say you should comment on active transportation plan part two and talk about the strategies and policies we need to move forward because I think it's really relevant to this, this conversation and tomorrow's on the safe system. Um, one of the questions shifting a little bit is to ask uh, Josh specifically about Tacoma's enforcement because some of the other sessions have talked about the equity issues around automated enforcement. And I know you spoke to that somewhat, but we, we had quite a bit of conversation with Dara Baldwin's presentation and the one on uh, enforcement and active transportation earlier today. So could you speak a little bit more to what you see as the possibilities for Tacoma to, to really embed equity in that or talk about what you're already doing? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Barb. And we don't know the answer yet. Um, we're just starting that process. And of course, we're going to look at things like payment programs and payment forgiveness. But really what is matters is being thoughtful about how we use it and how it's deployed and how it's used. And um, I, I think looking forward in Tacoma, we want to make investments in the areas where they're most needed. And so that might mean directing some of the proceeds from automated enforcement in those areas so that we don't need to use automated enforcement at all. And so we're certainly gonna take a look at those things um, and we'll, we'll be happy to report back as that takes shape. Super. And I don't know if there's anything you wanna highlight a bit more, any of you who worked on the, the ADSACS white paper um, where you might point people to more information from that or other sources that are in that white paper. Okay. I think one of the per pertinent things that I would add is um, that um, um, while automated enforcement uh, data management um, and, and equity con con consideration could be approved, um, I, would, I would be saddened if that particular tool in our toolbox for lowering speeds were removed. Um, from that white paper that we put together, it was very clear that automated enforcement does work. And, and it works really well. Um, so um, would like to see how we can make it work better, um, but not to get rid of it completely, um, just from the perspective of wanting to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes for, for everyone. Yeah, let me, let me chime in too. Um, it's a good question. In Kirkland, we have we started automated enforcement in um, actually right before the pandemic. And we placed a number of cameras in our school zones. And I'm, I'm almost thinking about it, is there an opportunity at the back end to uh, be address the equity issues as well as the front end in terms of locating them, but also at the back end in terms of when people um, show up at court, for example, and, and make their case. Um, I got to sit in a court proceeding to, to actually kind of watch that occur and who was showing up. And, and, you know, a lot of them, a lot of folks that were showing up were folks that were, didn't have essentially the money to pay a citation. Um, and it was heartbreaking. And the judge was, had his hands tied in terms of not being able to essentially just dismiss the citation entirely. Um, based upon um, circumstances. So it could lower it substantially, but not, 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 not reduce it down to zero. So there are some kind of 
uh, judicial things that we, we could look into, I think, uh, to provide that flexibility. I might pick up on that with a, a question that just came in the, and ask Josh and, and John both maybe to speak to this, the cost of running the enforcement program in Tacoma, what somebody heard Josh was that 90% of, of the overall cost, like what you collect, 90% of it goes to running the system and 10% to public works. So correct that if we got that wrong. But Metro and Sound Transit have taken fair enforcement out of the court system and given not just the fine cost, but the time cost to go to court and to get childcare and everything. And, and Dara Baldwin certainly spoke to that. So for those who missed those presentations that Dara was in, there's more context and you should watch those when those are posted. But is there a way to do something that is not going into the court system for this? At all? Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. And it kind of gets to one of the points that John just made is that sometimes the people who are least, uh, the least able to afford uh, the citation are also the ones that are at least able to afford that time in court. And so I think it's a really important consideration. Um, and, and Tacoma, and for clarity, it's 10% of the net proceeds go to public works for traffic safety purposes, and the rest of it is to courts for administrating it. And um, some of the, the fees to the police department are for administering the program, and some are to support their traffic safety enforcement efforts. And so there, there are some, um, it's not a 90% um, that is the cost of running the system. That is uh, just 90% of the net proceeds don't go to the public works department. And so I do think that we've got a little bit of leeway to look at how those funds are used in the future. And as I mentioned, public works just took that program over this year. And so I think we've got some opportunity ahead of us. I wonder who wants to tackle this one. Um, I'm not looking at you or anything, Scott. Um, the nature, and you mentioned that now we'll be doing our analysis in population centers. So that includes those unincorporated places where land use change makes it maybe look and feel like a town, even though it hasn't incorporated. But state routes are traveling through the middles, uh, middle of cities. And so the, what the purposes of that roadway are different there. And I wonder if you might speak to the benefits of slower speeds, both for what's along the street, but also for traffic movement, that, that slower doesn't mean slower. Um, potentially for for overall flow and the things that we that we manage for and um, and also going beyond vulnerable users, which are obviously the interest in this summit, but that reducing crashes, I, all of the stats all of you shared were reducing all crashes, not just those involving folks walking or rolling. So just the benefits of slowing down. Um, well, I, yeah, I think hopefully we'll we'll know what those benefits are. But I, I think I think when we're talking about multimodal. Um, especially, you know, people, you know, walking and, and, uh, and, and, and biking is slower speeds make, make hopefully a little bit more inviting environment. And so if you're say in a smaller community, unincorporated community, I mean, the ones that I'm familiar with in Thurston County that I used to work in, I mean, there's people walking, there's businesses, there's a lot of activity, maybe it's not as much as downtown Seattle, but there's definitely activity there. And, you know, and, and higher speeds on a state highway, um, can make a difference on how vibrant that can be or maybe how safe it feels for folks being there. Uh, I know we, as a county official, we spend a lot of time in those areas uh, working with the state and the communities to help better define what that environment might be. The problem is obviously the challenge, I think John mentioned, is there's, there's linking the investments with what we might want to, what we might visualize in those areas. So that, that is an cha ongoing challenge. But in the urban areas, I think the same thing is, is and, and to your point, uh, or I guess you're leading, I guess, the question, but you know, the, the slower speeds may uh, really slow your commute time. And, and the answer, it doesn't necessarily do It doesn't necessarily uh, do that. And, um, you know, there's an example, it's in Golden, Colorado, where there was a multi-lane highway going through a commercial area and the city converted multiple signalized intersections to roundabouts, um, did some access, uh, access management. So there's some medians in there. And so the average speed was lower, but the commute time was faster because there was less delays at, at some of the different critical junction points. And so, so the slower speeds help with safety because there's significant crash reductions, um, but it also facilitated some of the other needs of that particular area. So actually the commercial receipts actually went higher. So that was good. Um, and we had slower over, and there was slower overall corridor speeds, which helps in a lot of ways. And so, um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I think slower speeds probably help out all, all around probably at the end of the day. And then we do talk about all crashes because as a former county official, 
Uh, one of the challenges you have in the county areas are, are rural run off the road crashes and certainly slower speeds um, lead to less severe crashes. And, and that, that translates across the spectrum, I think, uh, of, of our safety profession. So. And John, you mentioned that the pushback that you get from, from folks who assume slower speeds means it's gonna take me a lot longer to get someplace. And so if you have anything to add, I'm just thinking about the stories we tell about why this actually benefits everybody, just not just me. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. What I was saying in my presentation just about setting of speed limits and changing speed limits is particularly um, when you have elected officials um, making the ultimate decisions on some of these things uh, is that you want to be able to share those success stories from other communities, what led them to decisions, how did those decisions work out, um, and then be able to lean on that. Um, because you do have a responsibility to address that question, um, not dismiss it, but address it. Um, and so it's really helpful to have the data and other information to, to really support your conclusions. And I'm also just thinking about incident response time is time. Yeah, so I was going to just add that uh, I know I've, I've seen some presentations that the city of Seattle has done where they look at that and um, that reducing the number of crashes that occur on a corridor actually improves throughput and lowering speed reduces the crashes. And so um, they were seeing it overall either stays the same speed or uh, increase. And the other thing is the dependability of how much time it's gonna take you to get to your destination. Um, you know, it, you need to be able to count, it's gonna be count on it's being the same amount each time. And if you have to incorporate the slowdowns associated crashes, um, then that's not actually a good thing for, for managing your, your transportation time. There's a term I thought came from bike racing. Apparently it comes from maybe seals or something that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You can use that for traffic. I'm seeing quite a few comments in the chat that are ideas around or questions around what happens once you've got the ticket in the court system. And I don't wanna put any of you on the spot for, for direct answering, but I do think I'm seeing things that could go back into the, the Cooper Jones ATSEC process as the white paper is developed. And there are other folks having these con conversations around transportation and policing and the court system. and and to make sure that those questions and concerns are in that so that it's not, we didn't even think about it. Um, you know, we assume it's all fine that you got a ticket. So let's, let's pick up on those. There is one question. I don't know if any of you have some ideas or awareness about what's happening because driving driver behavior is a piece of this. And we've talked about the design changes and the operational changes, but if anybody knows more about education and outreach um, around the getting the lead foots to slow down, it would be great to share that with folks too. I don't have anything top of mind. It's more. No, I, I'd love to know more. <laughs> how, to, how to, how to, I, you know, I think what, what we do find is that you're not, you're not going to necessarily address all the, the high speeders, right? But you are going to impact those that are doing it unconsciously, right? Uh, that don't mean to, that would slow down. It's those that just don't care. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have an answer for. <laughs> I was struck by something Dara said that was basically for somebody who says, yeah, it's a $35 ticket. So what, that's my price. That's, that's the tax I pay for speeding and I will continue to do that. So we haven't changed anything with a penalty. We, don't, we haven't gotten the outcome we were after at all. Uh, I thought that was, that was an important point. Um, I am just checking questions. So I, I would just add to that um, how important it is to think about the tools that we have that help roads be self-enforcing. So yeah, it is a behavioral choice um, to go at a higher speed. If you're traveling through a corridor that is roundabouts, um, that has uh, chicanes, that has speed humps, raised crossings, that does make a difference in people's behavior. Uh, you know, whether it's they're intentionally wanting to speed or not, um, that they typically help. Uh, so um, 
Yeah, that is, and those are the things that are in our wheelhouse, right? The, that, that education piece, like I said, I'm, I'm really counting on our partners to be there to help with that. But for, for us and what we're, we're doing, we're really thinking about how do we change behaviors by changing the road. I'm struck by one of the comments, and this was a, a suggestion in an earlier se session that Dara made, Dara Baldwin made about reaching out to community groups and talking about um, the impacts, that's not a pun there, that's a literal term, the impacts of speed and crashes on their neighbors and the people you care about. And I'm thinking for us as an agency, when we're doing outreach around why a roundabout is useful, that personalizing of who is it you know who needs to cross this or when we're going to do a road diet. Um, that conversation isn't just input on the design. It is an, op an opportunity for that kind of sort of direct personal engagement in, in what we're trying to change. So uh, kind of a takeaway for me to think about on that. I might do that. Um, yeah, uh, thanks to Charlotte for mentioning some of those design elements that can slow speeds. And Charlotte, if you'll help me remember last year's speed management workshop that we had in this summit, does it include some of those treatments? Do we want to point people back to that um, video? To yeah. It, it sure does. Um, we had our pre-conference session uh, with Peter Kuntz, and um, I will uh, take a minute to go find that recording and drop it into the chat. Thanks. Okay. All right. Super. We're getting close to the end. I'm just going to check our questions here a bit more and remind folks that our next session tomorrow morning at 8.30 our time in the Pacific time zone is Mobil Mobilize Washington and it's stories from disabled Washingtonians around the state. And then for those who've been participating in the summit along the way, we started Monday with a keynote with um, Alex Hogor and Liz Jackson, and they invited folks to conduct an audit of a fairly traditional transportation document. And so the link's gonna be dropped into the chat to remind you to go read that and just mark it up. Imagine that you're, at, you're asking yourself, is this complete? Does this tell the story? for the transportation plan that, that would result at the end of that. And we also have a summit feedback form dropped into the chat <clears throat> for you to give your feedback on this session. And I'm just gonna scroll back up one more time because we have a couple more minutes, but we don't have to go to five if everybody's done asking questions. Um, and as I said, you've got some great comments that we wanna harvest, so we will save the chat so that we have all of these to take back to the Active Transportation Safety Council. I'll give everybody just the chance to, if you've got any final thoughts from the questions and conversations that we've had that you think folks could take away, go back to their communities to work on safer speeds in any order. Are you, are you talking, are you, is that a question for us? Sure, yeah. I thought, I thought there was a number of good comments to think about, at least to take back to, like you said, the, the safety council to be thinking about at the state level, uh, what we can do. I, there was an interesting comment that I, I saw earlier by one of my colleagues um, on the Kirkland Council about uh, coming from a state where school zones are 15 miles and miles per hour. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't know that. Um, that that's interesting uh, uh, to, to see how, how that's, how that's working in, in those states and what they were considering. Um, there's a, the other one that I like is from a, a transportation commissioner in Kirkland Faith that talking about, you know, if, if you are a biker or you are a walker, you know, put yourselves into their shoes, um, especially the teenagers and those that are, that are younger and, and get them to really think about um, um, what they need to be thinking about when, when being a, becoming a driver, right? And certainly that's a great way, great way to learn. And I think we, we all learn that best by doing things. And I'll just note, we've had a couple of questions about managing semi-autonomous vehicle speeds for variable speed limits or road conditions um, as not the vehicle designers. I don't know how much you've been able to factor those kinds of things into what you're doing in traffic design, but if anybody's got some thoughts on our robot overlord future. I think that's probably a work in progress. Um, I would, you know, there's a lot of challenges. I think from what I mean, uh, from 
you know, incorporate autonomous vehicles in, into the roadway system. I mean, just the just their their detection technology and and what our road system actually looks like. And so, uh, you know, I'll take any more specific in that, but there, there's certainly some challenges in how that's going to evolve over time. So, I don't know if we have all the answers yet. I'm not sure you are, but yeah, yeah. I, I will note, I got the chance to hear Tim Papandreou speak a while back, and he used to be with San Francisco uh, Transportation or, or Metro and worked for Uber for a while. And he said a protected bike lane is great for autonomous vehicles because it creates a hard edge for the vehicle to detect. And I think that is a really reasonable approach. So take that for, for what you will. And Charlotte has shared a link to last year's presentation that was really a deep dive into some speed management treatment approaches. So you might couple that with having participated in this one today. And uh, just note that there's a ton of links dropped into the chat. If you wanna launch all those windows, there's several resources there, including that draft policy framework for an injury minimization approach to speed management. And uh, that's a tool that you can take back to your communities and invite folks to see about adopting that. And another suggestion from Karen um, for all the staff to go out and walk in any jurisdiction to go walk bike their own community. Uh, yeah, a little more from the saddle, from the sidewalk, if there's a sidewalk experience would be a great thing. And we, we did that within WashDOT for some of our engineers in a multimodal lab. Um, it's an eye opener for sure. With that, I think I'll give everybody a couple minutes back, remind you to fill out the feedback form and join us for the next session tomorrow morning at 8.30. Thank you all. <laughs>